The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening. Thank you for joining SpectraCell's Thursday night webinar program. My name is Jessica Owen, and I will be your host. Today's presentation is the new emphasis of lipoprotein particles for cardiovascular risk assessment. Before we begin, I have a few quick announcements. All callers are placed in lecture mode to avoid interruptions during the presentation. To submit a question, please click on the question tab. If time permits, at the end of our presentation, we will address the question submitted. The presentation is being recorded and will be available at our website at www.spectracell.com in our Clinical Education Center. At this time, I would like to welcome back our Director of Lipid Science, Dr. Jan Troop. Hello, this is Jan Troop. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, we're going to talk today about the new emphasis of lipoprotein particles for cardiovascular risk assessment. Um, there has been a lot of, there's been a lot of changes recently in how we look at um, lipids and cholesterol uh, risk assessment and in treatment, um, both from a, a regulatory perspective as well as a scientific perspective. So I'm hoping to cover these different areas. Uh, the topics I'm going to talk to you about today are the ATP3 guidelines, the NCEP ATP3. Those are the current guidelines that we're, we're using. And um, the current uh, guidelines actually talk about these new uh, subgroups and the new risk factors. And then we're going to talk about the fact that there doesn't appear to be an ATP4 announcement coming anytime soon um, and what, what that consequence is. Uh, I also want to spend a fair amount of time on the fact that we have made some major improvements in the LPP process in the last year or so. Uh, most of them finished by around April 1st, and these improvements should uh, dramatically uh, change how you treat your patient and how we assess risk. Um, I've also been asked um, by questions up front uh, to sort of compare the technologies of the LPP to other technologies so that um, you have a better understanding of what's available and, and how they're different. And I'll try to do that as we go through, and then we can also talk about that in question and answer if, if more need, if more discussion is needed. Um, at the end of the presentation, the last part of it, I want to actually go through some treatment examples and a therapeutic approach on a few case studies. So we're going to do that as well. So hopefully this will give you a good overview of what's going on in both um, the guidelines and with LPP and and how that affects you as a as a clinician. Okay, ATP3. Uh, that's we've been under those guidelines since 2001. Um, the main thing that came from ATP3 that's really important is that 50 percent of the individuals uh, at risk are not identified by the guidelines. Um, they recognized that in ATP3. There wasn't a solution per se, but they alluded to one. And then also 50% of heart attack victims have normal cholesterol. So clearly that's not good enough. And in those guidelines, they identified a number of what they call new lipoprotein risk factors or emerging lipoprotein factors, risk factors. They have now since emerged, so we don't call them emerging anymore. They're, they're, they're actual risk factors, and there's a lot of uh, studies and things that have been done to uh, support that. Um, so in order to, uh, these new risk factors are used to help assess those at risk. Um, we were expecting within this last year or so to have the announcement of ATP4, which would maybe take ATP3 and add these new risk factors to it and go to another level. Um, there was an announcement in, in June uh, of this year uh, saying that they will actually default to the industry consensus, and I'll discuss that here in a second. Okay, I want to sort of talk about the evolution of the lipid panel and where we are going today. Uh, to start with, everybody you should all be familiar, and I'm sure you are, with the fact that total cholesterol is the sum of, of VLDL, LDL, and HDL. And when we do a, a calculated LDL, we take total cholesterol, which is that sum, subtract the HDL, and we estimate the uh, VLDL by taking a triglyceride value and dividing it by 5. 
unfortunately for real people, that 5 is somewhere between 2 and 10. So a calculated LDL is a pretty bad estimate in general. A direct LDL, which we run here at SpectraCell, and that's part of our standard lipid panel that's on every LPP, is a much better estimate of, of risk and LDL than, than this calculated value. All of these are the guidance that we use in ATP3 to try to determine risk assessment. What happened, um, actually starting in 2008, and here you can see in this um, um, insert um, the, the progression of consensus statements with the American Diabetes Association, the American College of Cardiology in 2008 came out, and what they said is that particle numbers as measured by ApoB or, par or particles measured by other methods are more predictive of risk than cholesterol. Uh, the Canadian uh, Cardiovascular Society, the National Lipid Association later, and then finally recently, the Association of Clinical Endocrinologists all made their consensus statements, which are the same as the American Diabetes Association. Well, what this means is that instead of the, the, the uh, statement by uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute that ATP4 was going to be canceled, and they're going to default to the guidance, basically, of these different agencies means that the guidance now is that particle numbers is more predictive of risk than cholesterol, and that's what we should be using versus LDL cholesterol, like up above in, in this slide. Um, so measuring particles or ApoB is a better predictive of risk than cholesterol. And an extension of that is that lipoprotein particle numbers measured by subgroups is even better than just knowing the particle numbers overall, like in an ApoB uh, value. OK, so the new lipoprotein risk factors, what are they that were under ATP3, and what are and really the, the basis for a lot of the advanced testing today? Um, I'm going to go through them just in the order in which they appear from large to small. Uh, remnant lipoproteins, also called remnant-like particles, RLP, um, are very atherogenic. Um, one of the most important parts of that is that they don't have to be oxidized to be taken up by macrophage cells and form plaque in atherosclerosis. About 25% of our population has high ROP. And an interesting new twist on ROP is that a recent paper showed that ROP is actually a pro-inflammatory um, LDL or, or particle, because it's not all LDL, as I'll explain later. But actually, um, LDL itself is not necessarily a pro-inflammatory LDL. The next of the four new risk factors is small, dense LDL. We call it small and dense because it's both small and dense. It depends on the method of measurement to determine whether it's small or dense. Um, it's atherogenic because it can penetrate the endothelial lining of your artery more rapidly than the larger particles. Um, it's easily oxidized as opposed to the remnants where they don't even have to be oxidized. And it's less recognized by LDL receptors um, than larger LDL particles. So they stay in circulation longer. And about 30% of the population has high, small, dense LDL. LP little a is another one. It's a small, dense LDL, just like we're, we discussed there above. <clears throat> it's easily oxidized. But it has another little aspect to it that makes it even more atherogenic, and, and that is that it competes with a plasminogen and prevents fibrinolysis. And I have a slide on that that I'll show you in a second. But 25% of the population is um, high in LP little a. And high is above the 75th percentile. Uh, some people are curious about how that is determined. That's sort of a standard um, in, in a lot of assays. And then the last one of the uh, four new risk factors is the subsplit of HDL. Um, HDL3 is how your liver makes HDL. It picks up cholesterol, and it becomes larger and larger and becomes HDL2B. And the 2B is the end result of a reverse cholesterol, reverse cholesterol transport. And we want an adequate amount of 2B showing that it, uh, the HDL is functional. And about 25% of our population has low HDL2B. OK. so. How does LP little a comp compete with uh, plasminogen? First of all, fiber, if there's a blood clot, like a, an MI, a stroke, or even a DVT, deep vein thrombosis, we have uh, fiber, 
the fibrogen generated, uh, the fibrin then makes the clot, and typically plasminogen, if the clot isn't needed, um, plasminogen will come along, release plasmin, and dissolve the clot. Unfortunately, um, for L we have if we have high LP little a, it looks structurally and biochemically very much like, like plasminogen as the same uh, entities on the molecule on the LP apo L, uh, apo LP little a um, molecule, and that then competes with plasminogen and binds to the clot and sort of blocks plas plasminogen attack, so the, the clot continues to grow. Um, LP little a is an inherited lipoprotein. There are about 40 genetic variations of it. Um, and if a person has that, we, we look at both the fact that it's a small LPL, it's easily oxidized, um, and it's also possibly prothrombotic. And I have a number of examples and slides that I want to show you about that. Uh, we'll go into that in some detail. Um, that was also the subject of a lot of the questions that came in today. Okay, so advanced lipoprotein testing. Well, in order to do this testing, we need to know lipoprotein subgroups, and we've just been talking about those subgroups, the four main ones that are of, of interest. So what are lipoproteins and subgroups, and how do, we, how do they cause cardiovascular disease? We want to answer those questions. Okay, this is a diagrammatic picture of a lipoprotein particle. They're spherical. Um, they have a, an apolipoprotein on them, at least, that, at least one either an A1 uh, or a B100. If it's HDL, it's an A1, sometimes an A2 in addition. Um, a B1 on every um, VLDL and, and LDL, there's also a B100. Um, and on LP little a, in addition, there's an APO little a, uh, APO lipoprotein also attached. On the surface of the particle is our phospholipids. And, and that's sort of nature's ingenious way of taking a blob of fat and allowing it to circulate in an aqueous environment of, of your bloodstream. So we have a phospholipid that has a hydrophobic um, inside, uh, tail on it and a hydrophilic outside. So the hydrophobic end goes in toward the fat and the hydrophilic end goes out toward the aqueous environment and forms a shell. So it allows it to circulate in the bloodstream. Also on the surface of the particles, we have unesterified cholesterol. And then in the particle, we have both cholesterol ester and triglycerides, and those are the main fats that we are, are concerned about, although all of them are, are important. So in terms of atherogenic particles, we have uh, our VLDL particles, which are the largest. Those hold most of the triglycerides uh, in the VLDL, and I've got sizes there to give you an idea and densities. Um, size and density run hand in hand. As, as the density increases, the size decreases. So um, back when I said we measure small, dense LDL, if we're measuring electrophoresis, we're looking at size, if, like in the Berkeley Heart Lab testing. Um, if we're measuring density, we're looking um, at, if we're measuring density, then we look at uh, the density of the pro, as an ultracentrifugation, we look at the density, and that tells us what the size is. Um, that was when we, when, the testing for lipoproteins is first determined um, by the CDC. They were looking at ultracentrifugation. When they said low-density lipoprotein, the density came from ultracentrifugation. So that was really the initial standard. After that, other testing methods have come along that had to correlate those sizes with particle, uh, those densities with particle sizes. Okay, this is uh, remnant lipoproteins. Uh, remnants are a lot smaller in general than, than the larger VLDL particles and also contain uh, triglycerides, and they're about half the size roughly. And then we have the smaller LDL particles. We have large LDLs that are not considered part of the remnant group and, and small LDL particles. And what's interesting is that what I'm trying to show here, I think, is that these particles that are atherogenic, all of the, the RLP, the large LDL and small LDL, the sizes really aren't all that hugely different, 25 nanometers down to 19. And this mean size is about the average pore size. That's how we've actually discriminated these um, in the endothelial lining of your artery. So what we've decided is that if they're smaller than this certain middle size here, um, then they can actually penetrate the pores more rapidly than the larger particles. Um, 
the definition really came, though, from, from the pore size, not from the size of the LDL. Okay, this is a, a diagram of uh, the uh, production of atherosclerosis. In the arterial lumen, we have the circulation of all the different lipid particles, and then now, and then we have in this artery, in this artery, we have our arterial intima where all the action occurs. So initially, we have monocyte cells that penetrate uh, damaged endothelial linings of, of the arteries. Um, these then differentiate into what we call macrophage cells. Um, smaller LDL particles can penetrate that lining more rapidly than the large particles. Um, and when they penetrate, that in, them, in itself is not a problem, but if they become oxidized um, due to low levels of maybe antioxidants, then the macrophage says, ah, oh, that's a, a dysfunctional LDL, and I'm going to gobble it up, and, and it takes that, and it builds what we call a foam cell. Uh, these foam cells that accumulate, and that's our plaque. Um, we get then uh, the situation, well, where is our remnants that we were talking about? Because we've talked about small LDL, LP little a. Um, well, the remnants are here, too. They can get through those pores as well. And when they get through, they really don't have to be oxidized to be taken up by macrophage to form plaque. So they can sort of bypass that step. However, if they are oxidized, they're even more readily taken up by macrophage than even small LDL, which should give us an indication of just how atherogenic they are. Um, this is part of the story. So to have an, an incident or a, 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 an event, so to speak, we need to rupture this plaque. And that's quite often associated with inflammation, uh, as measured by things like C-reactive protein or CRP. So inflammation ruptures it, then, as we all know, that cascading effect of red blood cells, um, uh, plaque content, and so forth, forms a clot, which eventually leads to maybe an MI. OK. I want to talk about a mechanism that's critical to the changes of one particle into another. And, it, and it's all tied around an enzyme called CETP, or cholesterol ester transfer protein. Um, this diagram will help you understand that a little bit. Here we have a liver producing our ApoB, uh, making BLDL particles. Uh, lipoprotein lipases come along, convert them to smaller particles, our intermediate density of particles called IDL. And then hepatic lipases come along and reduce that particle down to a smaller particle, which is our LDLs 1 and 2. Um, it can, under certain conditions, then come along and reduce it further, kicking out some of the triglycerides that may be present to form LDLs 3 and 4. And that reaction is, is caused by two things, the presence of excess triglycerides and the enzyme CETP. And I've got an arrow up there showing the, doing this, this going back and forth. If triglycerides are high, it tends to drive that reaction to the right towards smaller particles. Triglycerides are low, um, and, and the enzyme activity isn't outrageous, then it goes back to the left. The same mechanism occurs for H HDL. So we have our liver making our ApoA1, a, a nascent HDL, which is sort of a discoidal HDL particle that enters the cells and arterial intima, goes and tries to gather up cholesterol. Um, and then LCAT, another enzyme, comes along and will help us sterify the cholesterol and eventually builds our HDL2B particles, which are the end result of reverse cholesterol transport. That particle then goes back to the liver, drops off its cholesterol stores, and re-exits as another uh, nascent um, HDL particle. But you can see CETP is involved in both of the conversion of HDL3 to 2B and involved in the LDL1 and 2 to LDL3 and 4. So it's a very important enzyme. Most of the, that arrow direction that was con is controlled by things uh, by triglyceride levels. Um, if we're up there at the top where we're looking at LDL1 and 2, if triglycerides are not exceptionally high, they never end up going much to the HDL3 and 4. So co controlling triglycerides is very important. I have a slide later on metabolic syndrome, syndrome which looks very similar to this, and I'll show you that in more detail. So why do we need the LPP test? Uh, why do we need any advanced tests? Well, we need a more complete answer. After all, we're, kill we're killing 50% of the population that are unidentified by 50% of those that die of a heart attack that are under unidentified as being at risk. Um, 
the OPP has three additional risk identifying components. Um, it measures the lipoprotein particle numbers, ends up the new risk factors, it measures particle numbers, and we measure some other uh, risk factors. We, remember, we measure a, a CRP, uh, insulin, and homocysteine. And all of these give us a, a more complete uh, picture and identify many more people at risk. Okay, so the LPP process. I mentioned earlier that it uses analytical ultracentrifugation. That is the CDC gold standard. That's originally how LDL or low density lipoprotein was determined. Okay, the new gold standard is us, and that's the enhancements that we've made to the to the original gold standard, and that's actually the the ability to measure subfractions. Uh, we do that by using a continuous gradient, um, which gives us a better control than the original CDC standard had like a low density solution and a high density one. LDL went up, HDL went down, so you had a separation of the two. That's the, that was the gold standard. Now, instead of just having that, we have a continuous gradient, so we separate the uh, LDLs and HDLs um, into many different uh, subfractions. Okay, and we measure the clinically relevant lipoprotein particles, uh, not the surrogate marker cholesterol. Um, that's the consensus now of the industry, that that's more predictive of risk. So how do we measure these particles? Um, initially, what we do is we take a, a fluorescent dye and they, it has a phospholipid, it's a phospholipid analog. It has a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end, just like the phospholipids on the surface of this particle. So when the hydrophobic end embeds in the phospholipid uh, shell, then the lipoprotein, the hydrophilic end, fluoresces of, of, the, of the dye, like that. And so we have then fluorescence, and that's a direct measure of particle numbers. It really doesn't matter how many cholesterol molecules or triglyceride molecules there are in there, but the response on the surface of the particle tells us how many particles are present. Okay, so we separate by density. Now, what's happened in the last year or so um, has been the fact that we're using robotics today in the LPP process, and we're arriving at a, a, a gradient um, that we can achieve much more rapidly than in, in the past but it also is much um, more accurate in that we can sort of fine tune and adjust the gradient and, and optimize the separations that we have. So in the middle here um, of the uh, tube, you see a band. That's sort of the, the lipoproteins unseparated. And then we apply a 600,000 G source, the high, fastest centrifuge on, centrifuges on Earth. They separate the, that's, that uh, band into our LDL, VLDL, HDL, and proteins at the bottom. And we know exactly the densities at each point along the tube. And so that's sort of the, the separation method. Now, this can be compared to something like the VAP procedure, um, uh, made or produced by uh, Athrotec. They separate by ultracentrifugation, but they're measuring cholesterol at each point along this tube, not particle numbers. So our process is similar. Um, it's a, our, our uh, gradient is a higher accuracy gradient, a little more sp specific at each point. And uh, I could go into that in more detail later if someone wants to talk about that. Um, but more importantly, it measures particles at each of these points and not, not cholesterol. And I'll, I'll point this out a little bit more in another slide when we get into it. Okay, so this is the profile that we finally see. Now, we have a, a very accurate density scale on the, the x-axis, and then on the y-axis are our particle measurements. So the black line is the response. The, the blue, yellow, red, that's just a template. Um, it's meant to approximate the, the cut points or the, the areas where we go into uh, higher, medium, or borderline values. Okay, at the beginning, we have our VLDL. And um, you'll see a VLDL 1, 2, and 3. I'll be talking about that a little bit more at the bottom there. The next section is IDL and, H and uh, VLDL 3. That comprises RLP. RLP is actually IDL, or intermediate density lipoprotein, plus the last subgroup of VLDL. 
then this is actually boxing in all of the actual LDL particles, not the VLDL ones, but all the LDL particles. And there we show LDL3, and then further down, LDL4. Those are the smaller LDLs. So we have our large buoyant LDLs on the left side of this dashed line, and we have the small LDL particles on the right side of the dashed line. Okay, then at the end of the graph, um, on the far right, we have HDL3. That's how your liver makes your HDL, and as I was mentioning earlier. And then as it picks up cholesterol, it becomes HDL2B. So that's that area there that's been highlighted. So this shows um, all of the different subfractions. Um, the approximate sizes are listed down below this. So, and then at the top, it sort of brackets which what uh, subfractions are, are, are displayed. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about this graph and, and uh, helping you analyze it so that in the future, you can use this much more effectively in treating your patients. Okay, I'm, here's an example of a, a healthy profile. It's all in the green. We have low remnant lipoprotein, or RLP. We have a buoyant LDL peak, meaning that it's predominantly on the left side of that dashed line. When we say um, a, a type A or a buoyant LDL profile, what it means is that we have a, less than 30% of the, of the peak of the LDL peak being small. Everybody has some small, and everybody has some large also. But if you have more than about 25 or 30 percent, then it's predominantly a small dense profile and not a large, or a, a more of a large profile. We'll talk a little bit about how you treat that. Uh, okay, then over on the right we have HDL2B, and it's in the, in the green also. And you can see both from the graph and down below in the numbers that it's healthy. Okay, an atherogenic profile looks more like this. You can see just glancing at the graph the differences that are, are present. So in the far left, we have things like VLDL, and we have RLP. It's elevated. It's in the yellow. Up here, the LDL peak is almost 50% small, so that's a very dense profile. And the HDL2B is low. It's in the borderline range, and it shows up both in the, up the graph and in the numbers down below. Okay, this is our sort of the acid test that we're measuring particle numbers versus anything else. Um, the only really good gold standard we have for measuring particles is how well it compares to ApoB. And ApoB, we know there is one, it's really the protein that guides the construction of all VLDL and LDL particles. And there is one ApoB molecule on every one of those particles. So by measuring ApoB, we should be able to measure or uh, plot it against our VLDL and LDL particle numbers, and we should see a linear relationship. And we do, and we see a nice uh, value there of uh, 0.93. So ApoB, by the consensus statements, is more predictive of risk than cholesterol. If we were to plot this against cholesterol, it would look quite different. Um, one thing I guess I should point out is that um, the NMR technology um, actually doesn't compare nearly as well. Their R is around 0.82 um, compared to our 0.93. Uh, their argument that for the reason that it doesn't compare with ApoB is that ApoB is an error. Um, I find that a hard argument to swallow. Okay, this is an example uh, of three, and I'm sorry, four different people, all with the same cholesterol value. Okay, we have uh, patient A over here, 125 milligrams per deciliter of cholesterol, and we have large buoyant particles. And, uh, and then we have patient B um, with twice as many particles, but they're cholesterol depleted, and then meaning that there's less cholesterol in each particle. And then we have patient C that has more particles, well, smaller particles with more cholesterol, and that would be what we call it a cholesterol-enriched particle. And then finally, we have patient D with a lot of small particles that are cholesterol depleted. All these people have the same amount of cholesterol, but all have dramatically different profiles. Um, this is a good example if you look at the, um, the situation of uh, measuring cholesterol versus particle numbers. Uh, if you're measuring cholesterol, like in the VAP process, your patient B 
looks the same as patient A, but patient B has a lot more particles present. And from what we know from the, the graph that I showed you in the, uh, the generation of plaque, particle numbers are more important. And from the consensus statement, particle numbers are more important than cholesterol content. But this is a sort of a graphic way of, of analyzing that. Um, so we have low numbers of particles going to increase, going to very high particles, and certainly risk goes from, from left to right. We, we certainly don't want a lot of small particles. They penetrate that endothelial lining very rapidly. Um, there's a lot of them, so there's a lot of opportunity for penetration. Okay, so the relevance of lipoprotein particles. So there's this big disconnect between particles and cholesterol number. Uh, what we see is about 30% of our, pro our population is what we would call cholesterol depleted, or the other side of that is triglyceride enriched, um, and about 20% of the population is cholesterol enriched. The LPP test is like having an ApoB value, but broken down into subgroups. And as I'll show you here in a little bit, that allows uh, the physician to better treat the patient. Okay, this is our report. Uh, and we're going to go through this, and then we're going to go through the different types of problems that occur. Okay, so we have a two-page report, basically. Well, it's three pages, but the two pages are, are the most important, these first two. Um, initially, we have our reference value in the middle and a sliding bar. So if the, value, if the diamond is on the right side of that, it's borderline or high. Um, we have it color-coded, so you can easily see it. I like this report for the, for the patient because if you're trying to explain to a patient like his IRLP there is um, is sort of right at the yellow, he thinks he's yellow, but if it's really right at the border of red, you can say, you know, we don't have to go very far before we got a problem here. So it, it gives them a better idea of just where they stand in terms of their of a high or low value. And then the so the magnitude I think is easier to judge with uh, with this type of uh, presentation. And then on the right we flag it for easy uh, analysis so that the doc can quickly scan that list and see what looks high and what looks um, borderline or, or low. Okay, I usually, when I'm talking to um, uh, our clients, and I'm, I welcome any of you to call in and discuss profiles when, when necessary, that's part of what we do here. Um, I always say let's go to page two of the report, because I first thing I want to do is I want to look at the graph. Um, I want to see what looks high, what look, looks low, and I'm going to help you understand that a little bit better in some of the future, some of the slides here down the road. So I look at that, and that's a drug measure of particle numbers. Um, we have primary uh, risk assessment from those particle numbers in the top part. So we have nanomoles per liter as opposed to, say, in a cholesterol measurement like a VAP of milligrams per deciliter. Those are one's particle measurements, the other's a cholesterol unit. Okay. And then in the next section, we have um, various uh, parameters that we look at for risk modification. Uh, the important one, the real important one, is the LP little a. And the other next most important, probably, or maybe as important, is the C-reactive protein number. And then at the bottom, we have our standard cholesterol panel. And that's good for comparative purposes. And, and sometimes, you know, you'll see things there that then you go and double check with the particle answers. So, it just depends on how you're used to looking at this. Okay, so to sort of break down this profile and, and start thinking about, about a therapeutic approach, the first third of the profile are the con triglyceride-containing particles. Those are the, uh, the VLDL particles and the IDL particles, um, as shown there in the bracket. And the treatments for those types of particles are omega-3 fatty acids, uh, fibrates, phenofibrates, uh, niacin, and, and statins will have an effect, but not as dramatic as some of these, some of these other therapies. The next section there are the large uh, LDL particles. If, if you're going to have LDL, you want it to be large, and uh, for various reasons. One is it doesn't penetrate the endothelial lining so rapidly, but also your treatment options are, are everything that we have, pretty much statins, niacin, biosequestrants, absorption inhibitors. Everything will work on large LDL. Now, when we go to small LDL, it's a different situation. The LDL3s will be reduced, if you can see they're right on the right side of that dashed line, will re be reduced to some extent by a statin, um, but for the most part, not much. And 
Niacin is a better therapy for small LDL. Um, also, for LDL3, something like a biosequestrant will reduce it. Uh, often, I'll see a profile maybe like this and maybe say the LDL3 is high and, and the doc will say, well, what do I do about treating that? And I'll say, well, look at that LDL peak. It's predominantly large, larger LDL. So if you just think about pushing that LDL peak straight down with your therapy, the LDL3 goes away. You don't have to treat that as a separate problem. And that's where the, the graph is so valuable in understanding that. Then as we go further across this, we see the HDL treat, uh, area and HDL2B. Um, the best treatment for that is uh, exercise. We can raise HDL and HDL2B chemically with niacin, but the jury's still out as to whether that therapy is really truly effective at, at reducing risk. Okay, back to blowing up this profile and taking a, a more detailed look at it. Okay, here's our LDL, or, sorry, our VLDL particles, VLDL 1 and 2. Um, the 1s and 2s are actually too big. Down at the bottom you can see they're 40 to 60 nanometers. Um, those are too big to penetrate the endothelial lining of your artery. However, the VLDL 3s are small enough and they're part of RLP. Um, and so those particles, if they're high, uh, present an additional problem. And usually then it, it slopes up like it does in this case into the red in the IDL area. Um, and I, I think I'd like to point out here the, the kind of detail that we can see in the profile that we never could see before. You can clearly see LDLs 1, 2, and 3 in this big picture. And often you can see that in our, re, in our new reports. Um, I think we don't talk a lot about that, but that's really valuable in understanding. If all you see is one and two, which is often the case, you think, okay, I don't have to worry about remnants so much. Maybe I just want to lower the guy's triglycerides. Um, it helps you understand the situation. Okay, so that ROP section then, those are the dysfunctional um, LDL particles. They're VLDLs, uh, the remnants of VLDL that never became LDLs, or they're on their way to becoming LDLs. And, got stuck at the remnant lipoprotein area. And remember, they don't have to be oxidized necessarily to be taken up by macrophage. They're dysfunctional, and um, macrophage identifies them as dysfunctional particles. OK, so that, that's particularly import, important in, in, in studies and outcome data. It's, highly, it's been shown over and over again that remnants are, are very atherogenic. Okay, now to move on across the profile, we look at our, our larger LDLs, LDL1 and 2. They contain most of the cholesterol. And uh, these parts, these uh, particles are, are oxidized. Um, it can be oxidized to build plaque. Uh, the smaller particles are more atherogenic, as we've been discussing, and those are the um, LDLs 3 and 4. And they're more easily oxidized than the larger LDL particles. And they're also harder to treat and our therapies are, are more limited. Okay, then further across the profile are the, is the HDL area, HDL 2A and 2B. Again, I'd like to point out that you can see a clear split in the graph up there with the, the HDL, where we go between 3 and 2. Um, other, other methods do not show this kind of detail. Um, so here we have HDL 2B and, and 2A. Uh, that's the end result of what we call reverse cholesterol transport. And then HDL3 is how your liver makes the HDL, and those are the smaller HDL particles. And um, those move in and out of the cells and arterial intima and other areas and collect cholesterol and become the larger particles. OK, to talk about an area that um, a lot of people ask questions about is the uh, LP little little a um, uh, subject. Uh, I mentioned there are 40 genetic, around 40 genetic variants of them. At the top we have one and it's centered over the LDL3 area. It's actually covering, if you look at that Gaussian, if you were to put a Gaussian peak under there, you would see that it goes from LDL1 and 2 all the way to HDL, but it's mostly in LDL2, 3, and 4. Um, if it's high enough in the profile, we can actually see it in that graph. Um, it has to be usually over 100 before we start to see it. Uh, the one below, in contrast, uh, is 180. Um, it's in the LDL4 and um, HDL2B area. 
Um, the problem with LP little a is we really don't know, depending on the genetic variant, where it's going to fall in the profile. And we now understand a little bit more about LP little a, and we're doing some research on it here at the SpectraCell. But what we understand is that you have a Kringle combination, which is the, they call it Kringles because they look, the proteins look like pretzels, but we have several Kringles, and Kringle 4 has 10 types to it. Type 2 of Kringle 4 can have up to 40 repeats, and that's where we get the biggest genetic variation. These 40 repeats dramatically change the size of this part of this uh, lipoprotein and change both the content of protein plus when it's wrapped around this particle, make it much, much bigger and more dense. Okay, so contrary to all the other particles where the, the smaller ones are more dense, everything, the smaller particles go to the right and they're the more dense particles, LP little a goes the opposite direction. So as we add on these larger Kringle counts, that increases the size of the particle, but it also makes it heavier. And so it ends up like the one at the bottom, if it has a lot of Kringle repeats. The one at the top is moving toward the left a bit. It would be one with fewer Kringles, uh, uh, type 2 repeats, would be a smaller LDL uh, particle, and would be more atherogenic because of the size. And also Kringle 10, or I'm sorry, not Kringle 10, but type 10 of Kringle 4 actually is the one that mimics plasminogen the most. So the more repeats we have, the more we cover up type 10, and the, more, the less mimicking of plasminogen we see. So the ones that are to the far right with more protein have that covered up more. The ones that are to the left more are more likely the ones that are more prothrombotic. So by sort of spotting, if we have a high number, we can spot it in the profile. That isn't always conclusive, but I wanted to give you a heads up because we can see it. These are two good examples. So the one on the top would be more atherogenic than the one on the bottom, even though the value is lower. And we know from other evidence that the higher cholesterol ones, which are the ones that have less Kringle repeats, are also more atherogenic from studies. So other methodologies have shown the same thing. This is a an example of a, a prothrombotic LP little a. Okay, it's fairly far to the left. Uh, it has a lot of these Kringle type 2 repeats. It's another example. And it's a smaller LP little a and it's prothrombotic. Okay, now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, metabolic syndrome. About a, a quarter of our population right now has metabolic syndrome and it's been increasing every year. Um, metabolic syndrome is a, a, a combination of a number of risk factors. But here's the main story, and I mentioned earlier that you'd be seeing this um, uh, diagram again. When we have our liver making ApoB and lots of, um, lots of uh, BLDL particles, high triglycerides, CETB comes along, and it actually um, will convert the LDL1 and 2 into an LDL3 and 4, and it kicks out triglycerides, it shrinks. The same thing happens sort of with lipoprotein lipases and RLP, and the same thing happens with HDL, and we get a depleted, cholesterol depleted, triglyceride enriched particle, and it gets smaller. Now in HDL, it's interesting, we generated small dense LDL up there, which is atherogenic, but in HDL we generate something else. And what happens is as HDL gets very small, it loses its ApoA1 lipoprotein, and that gets renally, renally eliminated, and so the HDL drops further. So what do we have here? We have all the characteristics of metabolic syndrome. We have high triglycerides, we have small LDL, we have uh, low HDL, and sometimes RLP. These are all the characteristics of metabolic syndrome. Um, in a profile, this is what they look like. So you see the triglyceride values, you see the low HDL value, and you see a small LDL profile. And so if we have three lipid traits, that's a probable diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. And so then we look for one other um, 
trait, which is a non-lipid one, hypertension, obesity, or high glucose, and that would be a diagnosis. And so what do you do then? Well, you raise the, list, the, the risk of the patient one level at least, so from high to very high or from um, moderate to high, and then you look for insulin resistance, uh, making sure the patient isn't already uh, diabetic or pre-diabetic. So we have several things we look at. Um, the big thing is changing the risk. That resets your target for, say, LDL particle numbers from being under 900, which is our reference value, to maybe under 700 or even if under uh, high-risk uh, situations, 500. Okay, so what are the important benefits of the LPP test? Okay, so we measure these new NCEP risk factors, the four NCEP risk factors, RLP, dense small LDL, LP little a, and the HDL2B issue. Um, we measure lipoprotein particle numbers as opposed to cholesterol. That's the new consensus of all of the major agency, uh, agencies in the country right now. We look at metabolic syndrome traits and count those for extra risk. And in the LPP Plus, we look at CRP, insulin, and homocysteine. Um, many stories right now around CRP are saying that it's just as important as a risk factor as many of these others. And so anytime CRP is raised, we should consider that raising the risk of the patient at least one level. Okay. This is a typical kind of profile. I'm going to now talk about a few examples. Um, I'm checking my time. I've got a few minutes here yet, and then we'll, we'll break for questions. Um, this patient has a low profile, low, it's all in the green except over in the far right, and that would be a standout issue. But this patient has had a heart attack, has had multiple stents, and we see immediately that the LP little a is outrageous, 265 right there, uh, CRP is elevated, 3.3, and the HDL is low. And that sort of explains why the patient had a heart attack. But at first glance, you see that most of the lipids are okay, HDL is a little low. That's not unusual when overall cholesterol is low. This person's total cholesterol is only 148. So this is a, a good type of, um, say, a good example of the hidden risk factors that led to a, a disease. Okay, here's a patient um, on four milligram, I'm sorry, four grams of EPA and DHA omega-3s, and we added uh, resubistatin or Crestor to the to lower the lipid levels, and then tricor phenofibrate to further low, lower the lipids. Um, the statin drug uh, lowered uh, LDL from, I'll just read it off, 152 to 78. That was a 48% reduction. So then, but the, but the um, we can't probably read it, but I'll read it to you. The triglyceride levels are, are at 182 still, which is pretty high. So the patient was put on a phenofibrate to try to lower that. Well, it, it did lower the, the triglycerides and the VLDL parts of the profile, also some of the smaller LDL parts of the profile. But another thing happened, LP little a increased by 32% and homocysteine increased by 32%. This is something we've seen at, at SpectraCell, and um, I don't think it's being observed other places, but what we found is that apparently uh, both uh, phenofibrate, or fi phenofibrates or phenofibric acid like trilipics or tricor will raise LP little a. So a lot of times therapies show that. Um, one of the last examples I want to show you or explain here, this was a study done at Texas A&M University looking at low birth weight babies. Um, what they found was that low birth weight babies had a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease later in life. And the characteristics they saw in the profile in this cord, on cord blood from these low birth weight babies was a very high, very um, buoyant HDL, a peak at around 1.06 density, which looks like it might be an LP little a, but it wasn't, and then very low VLDL at the front of the profile. All of these things together uh, characterized what they determined as a uh, APOC1 enriched a, uh, HDL observed in maybe 1 to 2 percent of the specimens. It's later been found to be a pro-inflammatory HDL. It causes endothelial dysfunction. And uh, we've had at least one example where a physician actually uh, had this profile and asked me what to do about it. And I said I would get a calcium score. She did. Found out she was in the 90th percentile in our calcium score when, in fact, she thought 
because of her high HDL and low VLDL and triglycerides, she was in great shape. So this is a very atherogenic uh, lipoprotein, and there's a reference at the bottom. Okay, the last slide is what do you do to treat these patients with different uh, subgroup abnormalities? Um, if it's ROP, omega-3 fatty acids are a really good choice. If it's large LDL, you have a whole variety of things, but statins work great. Um, so does niacin. Small LDL, niacin is excellent. LP little a, niacin is excellent. excellent. Notice that under fibrates, I've got an X now. Didn't used to have that there. If you're looking at HDL2B or lowering that, um, uh, raising it uh, lifestyle changes, um, exercise is probably the best. And also for HDL in general, um, niacin is an excellent therapy. Notice that niacin is a therapy for almost everything. It works very well across the board. Well, that's all I have. Um, so I guess, Jessica, you might want to see if there's some questions. Thank you, Dr. Troop. We do have some questions. The first one I have is, how do you lower triglycerides in vegetarians who will not take fish oils? Well, that's a good question. Um, there is uh, uh, an algal, well, the original source of, of um, omega-3s is from algae. Um, krill or fish eat the algae, and the bigger fish eat the small fish. And so there are algal sources out there um, for omega-3 fatty acids, and they're excellent. Uh, it's all DHA. Uh, one of them is made by Martech, um, so you might look that up on the web. There's a distributor called DHA Advantage that also has that product. Um, so there are sources out there for that type of therapy. Okay, our next question is, how does the LPP compare to VAP or NMR testing? I think I covered some of that. Um, with VAP, I mean, the big difference is that we're measuring particle numbers, not cholesterol. Um, and that's because of the, um, not only is it more predictive of risk, but it's also the consensus of various organizations. Um, the other thing is that they don't do a good job in their separation in VAP, and ours is a much more detailed separation, especially in the VLDL areas. And they, they try to integrate and determine LP little a from the profile when, in fact, you really can't always pull it out of the profile. We can see it sometimes, um, but it, it's only an estimate when they generate their LP little a value, as far as I'm concerned. We do a separate assay for LP little a. Um, for NMR, the big difference is we're both measuring particle numbers. In fact, they're the only ones that do measure particle numbers. But the big difference is that we do a separation um, in detail, and so you get very good subgroup information. But they tend to not worry about that too much. It's mostly total particle numbers and how in the risk assessment there. I think the part the subfractions are important for treatment strategy, and uh, just knowing particle numbers is not enough. Okay. Our next question is, what are strategies for reducing LPPA harmful subparticle levels in those with strong genetic predisposition to elevated levels? Yeah, you know, well, you know, most people that have high LP little a is genetic. So um, we have a variety of therapies. Um, I mean, niacin is the best therapy to reduce LP little a, but it, it'll only reduce it 25% at best. Um, and our NSEP guidelines say that you can do that or be more aggressive at LDL reduction. I'm an example of that. Um, I try to reduce my LP little a with niacin, but it, it will then trigger a gout problem. So I've gone to the, the second choice, which is more aggressive LDL reduction. Okay, thank you, Dr. Troop. It looks like we're out of time for any more questions. Remember, you can always contact your SpectraCell representative or email your questions to webinar at spectracell.com. Thank you and good night.